coming tonight and wanted to also just, um, both Becky and I, Becky's on vacation, so we're sort of tag teaming the in-person thing since it went so fast. But I really wanted to recognize all the participants, the school building committee who have worked very hard on this thing, and then the administration. Colleen has worked day and night and Kathy, yes, didn't get their vacations in, the administration who's here and so on, I really wanted to acknowledge them because they've done a phenomenal job. And we've got a couple people from the school building committee in the back, thank you very much. They're on the website team. The website should be coming up fairly soon. So I did just want to say thank you. And then Colleen is gonna come up and speak. Uh, oh. School Building Committee co-chair, Louisa Boatwright, and Becky Bolin is, like I said, can't be here because we did this in-person thing so fast. So, But um, Colleen's going to start out, and then we're going to just do the slam presentation tonight. But Joe DeSanti, also our OPM, is here tonight, and they have been doing a phenomenal job. I do want to announce, just on Wednesday, we got the certification to start uh, work at Pell. So Pell is starting on next Thursday, the 12th, is groundbreaking at 10 a.m. So please come. So that's great news, a year ahead of schedule. So that's pretty cool. So anyhow, we've all been working hard, and Joe DeSanti, thank you. Thank you very much, Louisa, and I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. Um, it is an exciting time here in Newport Public Schools. As Ms. Boatwright, Louisa just announced, uh, we have gotten, received all the green lights for Pell Elementary School, and we'll have our groundbreaking next Thursday. So I want to um, congratulate the whole team, and I'm going to be frank, without the co-chairs, Louisa and Becky, Kathy and I can vouch we would be... We would be uh, way behind so they keep they're good taskmasters they keep on top of us and they are very detailed oriented so we they, they make sure we keep things in order i also want to thank principal vance jessica rosa kendra mutner who's in the back there um they've been putting in a lot of hours um and i will admit zoom was a little easier we could hit the buttons wherever we were have the meeting and go um but Right now, what you're going to see is the vision for the Rogers High School going forward. And the vision of what, we're, what our goal is to have a fully integrated CTE high school, um, comprehensive high school. And that what that means is transparency throughout the entire building where students, teachers, everyone can see our CTE programming. They can see the hands-on learning. They can see... Um, teaching, learning, uh, students, small collaborative groupings as far as students working together, the skill sets that our children need for the future. Not only is it about learning content, it's learning about how to work with others and how to be a successful learner and achieve goals. So we're very excited about this and I have to say um, thanks to Joe DeSanti and our OPM, he's kept us on task too, and I think at times we go back at him, and uh, Kyle Lentini, who's um, taking a few days off, and then we have the remarkable team of SLAM with Mark Rhodes and Kathy Elthorpe, and I have to say, when people hear we have SLAM, they just go, wow, you have SLAM. So that's even more exciting. So I'm going to hand it over to Mark right now, and he's going to show us this the start of the schematic design and where we are as far as um, the new Rogers High School. So thank you. Thank you. So now I have a lot to live up to. That's kind of a big opening. So all right, we'll try to do that. Kathy will uh, come up and we'll talk about uh, some of the things that we've been doing in the last time since uh, we had a community meeting. We're going to go through the goals and objectives. It's very important, as Dr. Jermaine talked about, the idea for this project. It started with a really long and good and fruitful discussion about what you all need to do with this facility to position your students for the future to become a community asset to become something that you all can be proud of we'll go through a little bit of the previous scheme which i think is an iteration past what you saw the last time and then i'll show you where we are today with the scheme and some of the things that we've uncovered throughout the process because this is a discovery process for us so there's a lot of change that happens very quickly in an architectural design in this phase I would just want to describe a little bit of where we are in the process, too. If you look at 100% of a design from the start to the time somebody walks through the door, 
we're at about 15% in this first phase. So we've got a long way to go, but these are important steps to take because they are really the foundation for success as we look to move forward with this. So with the goals, I'm going to have to step aside because the screen's a little blurry. So the idea of Newport Pride, experiential learning, sustainable actions, and purposeful and resilient design. All of them are very important, but as Dr. Jermaine mentioned, this idea of experiential learning. We want kids coming together in this facility. We want community coming to this facility after hours for certifications for those kinds of programs. This is a facility that has to have a 24-7 life cycle to it. It just can't be a building that sits up on a hill and nobody interacts with it. So as we look at that, we want to create foster discovery and innovation. That idea of transparency is really critical because if I can't see something going on, I may not know what's going on. Therefore, I can't get interested in it. So I want to be able to see some of the CTE programs, whether that's, that could be the Colonial Kitchen, some of the great things that are going on there, although I've yet to have the lobster roll. I'm waiting for the lobster roll. Uh, looking for interdisciplinary learning and hands-on experiences, not only in CT, but in the sciences and some of the things that are kind of come from this facility that you haven't even thought of yet. We need to provide spaces that are adaptable and resilient for a 50-year period and beyond. Sustainable actions. Uh, it uh, warmed my heart that the last time we met, we kind of talked about sustainability, and you all were very interested in it. A lot of communities haven't really gotten behind that push yet. But this building is a big undertaking. At about 185,000 gross square feet, it's a large footprint on this land. So what we do around the facility and how we create uh, an energy efficient facility is really important. How water moves th through the site is very important. How it connects to the, the uh, biodiversity in the area around it is incredibly important. So sustainability is something that's near and dear to us. It runs through our veins, literally. We think about it every day. Uh, because we do want to keep doing built environments. As architects, we like to build, so that's important to us. Purposeful and resilient design. What's important about that is this building is going to have a life expectancy and it's going to have to do a lot of things over that, say, 50-year period. We know it's going to start one way in a couple of years when it opens up, but soon after that, things are going to change. CTE programs evolve. Things happen overnight, as we know. We're meeting here today in person versus uh, virtually. And Newport Pride, this is a facility that's all about you. It's all about your community, your kids, your teachers, your administration, and how you want to interact with this facility as it sits in this really interesting location. And I'll talk about some of the discovery things we've learned about the history of this location, which is just kind of mind-blowing as we think about it. Go to the next. I show, this is an interesting slide without color. <laughs> What we want to show is the column on the left, that 238,450 gross square feet, is the building we're in right now. So if we did a tally of all the area, of all the facilities, all the corridors, that's what that equals. It was designed for a, a large number of students, more than twice what you have today. If we were to design a facility for that amount of students today, it would be over 450,000 square feet. So the standards have changed quite a bit. The chairs you're sitting in are, are key. They have to move around. It's not, they're not fixed to the floor, they're on wheels, which can cause issues. We had, I'll tell you a story about Johns Hopkins and the kids that motorized the chairs later. But in the middle column, stage two, which was really about setting the table, that's kind of a theoretical design. It gets you your funding, it gets you the building through ride, the ride process, and gets us to stage three where you actually create a real building, a real facility out of that. Early in stage three, we got up to about 217, call it 220,000 gross square feet. We know that's too big, but we wanted to get the ideal school for this opportunity. So working together with the district, we've been able to pare that down to about 185, which is in 10% of the target range. That's about the ideal school right now. So about 185,000 gross square feet. So we've been looking to design with efficiency, but make sure we have this beautiful facility that you all will be proud of. Can we go to the next? As we look at the existing site, and I think we're standing somewhere right about there. Mark. Yes. Uh, Seven hundred fifty-five. That's the demographic. We have about fourteen hundred seats in the facility, so we're about a one to two ratio. Most. High schools are about 1.49 to 1.54. 
So we've built in a lot of redundancy in the program. So there's the ability to flex as you go. The existing facility, one of the things we know about this as we design modern facilities, too many doors, too many corridors. If I'm a poor freshman and I'm stuck down here and I got to go over there, my legs, I might be able to make it, but you know, some of the kids, it's tough to get back and forth. You have all these issues that are around that. And we had great meetings with the students. And some of those discussion points, albeit very difficult to hear at times, there's a lot of candor and your students are engaged and active, which I thought was really important for us. And it gave us information that we don't often get from their perspective. What's it like to walk around these halls? What's it like to interact with each other? What's an optimal learning space look like for them? So we've taken all that in and now kind of bringing that back out into a built form. So the next. So this is a site plan that's old to me, but probably new to you. Uh, one of the things I know we talked about early on with you is this idea of keeping the gym, which is that spot right there. So we've been doing a lot of investigative work around that gym. One of the things we've discovered is that maybe not such a great idea. It's got some structural issues with the W-shaped roof, trying to make that watertight uh, in a new facility was going to be complicated. It has issues in terms of programmatic problems. It was stretching the site to connect to it. So we're having to take everything that we had and stretch that program across the site, which was not creating an integrated facility. It was creating a zone over here and a zone over there. It wasn't bringing everything together. So we started to investigate, all right, so if we took the gloves off and knocked the building down, the existing gym, and gave a new gym, what would that do? What kind of opportunity would that unlock? So with that in mind, we've gone ahead and looked at trying to compress the site. I make a joke, it looks like a big pork chop on a site. So we've taken that pork chop and we've tried to compress it and compress it in a way that we bring people together and create this sort of learning environment that we talk about the beehive effect. You don't want you know, two people over there and three people 100 yards away from them. You want them connected, especially post-pandemic. So we want the next one. Excuse me, where yeah. Uh, I'll show you. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see the problem. The, the blue dotted lines represents the circulation system. So albeit less circulation paths than you have today, it still stretched the building out too far. So it was a long walk from where we stand today all the way over to the main academic wing of the building. There were some great spaces, some great ideas. So all of this is done. Uh, not that it's one and done. This is one of probably 16 studies we've done to date. But we learn lots of things in doing these, that we, we have these conversations. We get to reapply this stuff and repractice what we're, what we're looking at. Some of the things that did come out of this, the idea of addressing Wickham Road with a bar-type building that's multiple stories, collects a lot of the classrooms, collects a lot of the administrative spaces. Off of that, having a major, you can see the blue bubble, in the purple bubble. In this scheme, that was the cafeteria seating, the heart of the building, really the cultural heart. It was even getting pushed a little bit to the extreme because of that, the location of the existing gym. It was forcing our hands in planning a little bit. And we were stretching a lot of the CTE and athletic spaces around it, but it was really creating two halves of the building that wasn't as integrated as that it could be. So just to show you the upper floors, <clears throat> you can see that was also a one-story footprint. There's some ADA issues around the existing gym. Trying to get access to those upper levels was complex and expensive. Uh, it was going to end up costing us more money to save the gym than to replace it. We also had a lot of one-story space around it. When you talk about spreading that footprint out, that was an expensive way to do it. That's a lot of concrete, a lot of foundation. So we decided to compress things a little bit. Can go to the next slide. So third floor looks a lot like the second floor. So things we learned in this process, we liked the idea of having the, the courtyards you have today. There are a lot of really elegant courtyards. We want to try to integrate at least one courtyard into the facility that would allow students and, and faculty and administration to sort of see the outside from the heart of the building. We want to have that interaction allows us to get daylight deeper into the building, which is a nice sustainable strategy. It also becomes one of the key organizing features in the building. So we kept that. We kept thinking about that. 
we thought about the cafeteria, and Jared has this great idea of a media center with no walls. So you leverage the cafeteria, combine it with a media center, and now you have this buzz around technology and learning, research, entrepreneurial spirit. So the whole building centers around that. So if we go to the next image, the pork chop is gone, and we end up with a much smaller footprint. Just to give you a reference, the old gym is right about, right about there. Where we're standing right now is right about there. So we've compressed the footprint. We've gone a little bit more vertical. I've added a second story, which I'll show you, to part of this. I'm also exploring a four-story block for here. Compressing that footprint, using the elevators more efficiently, the bathroom stack, the stair stack, all of that makes a lot of sense. You'll notice something other else that's very important. With a compressed footprint, we're able to get a more idealized parking situation, which means potentially another field. So where we were before with the building stretched out, we couldn't get that open space. So now we have the potential of getting, here's the cell tower right here, potential of another practice field in that location. That didn't exist in stage two. That's because we've, we've all worked together to shrink the footprint get more efficient about how the programmatic pieces come together. The track, about in the same location, its orientation has changed a little bit. And doing that, we're pulling it away from the neighborhood. We're fixing some drainage issues. There's a little bit of a, uh, we'll call it a dip in the land right here. We also are looking at streamlining circulation on a site. So if I'm coming on a bus. I'm coming through here by the tennis courts. That parking gets redone in kind. Right here. I can get off the bus and I can come right into the building. If I'm a faculty member or I'm a student that gets the privilege of parking or I'm coming to visit, I'll come in here and I'll park in here. So we keep the bus traffic and car traffic separate for, for those big heavy times of influx and egress. So you've got a lot of green space as you approach. The center of that building is going to be the heart that I described before. I'll show you in a plan in a minute. What this also does is creates a nice service area off in the back. So now we know we have a bunch of buses that are getting kicked out of their current home that we have to find a place for. So putting them in the back there, well screened by all the trees and the hill, is a great spot. Keeps it away from the public so you don't have that interference or that interaction. Service side of the building also through here into there. So loading dock, all that will be hidden and screened. This is an important spot too as you look over the field. The idea is the colonial kitchen is right here and you can come out of that to a terrace and it'll overlook the field. So if there's a game going on, like homecoming, and you want to use that space to have a party, you can do that. So that's kind of a nice feature of the building, sort of addressing the athletics in the gym in its current location doesn't allow that. Planning. So it's hard to read this, so we're going to show this in a couple different ways. This is a black and light drawing. This is from our Revit model, which is a three-dimensional parametric model we build of the facility. You can start to see lots of lines. So the grid lines are structural systems. The blue lines were just showing major circulation. Remember that big arcing path? It's now what we call a racetrack. So it's much, much cleaner. All around the heart, the media center, open to the courtyard, as well as the gathering in the cafeteria space. Elegant entrance, gymnasium right here, lockers for a PE, main office right here, good security as you come in check through right there, so your credentials are checked, and then you can get into the building. Lobby space, probably a media wall, a staircase here that we call a steratorium, so you can walk down steps on one side but sit on the other side. And that two-story common space. We've brought art over here, Ninth Grade Academy, ALP, with its own entry points to kind of integrate things into that and around that space. The Black Box Theater right here. The big garage door opens up. That now can be used with that big cafeteria space for a bigger event. There's also a partition that folds down in the middle 
that creates two separate rooms out of that space. So it will never sit vacant. Band could be in here, chorus could be here. They can't hear each other because of the sound transmission quality of that space. It's a high quality uh, wall system. Support spaces for that, the kitchen and servery. Oops, sorry. Yeah. I was gonna pull my arm out and point, but uh, uh, kitchen and the uh, servery on that end of the building, main loading dock, hidden by the building on that side. So it's sort of tucked in. Very simple or organization, nurse down here as well. Easy access for kids and parents to get in as folks need the, the nurse. Colonial kitchen in this location, that outdoor plaza with views to the fields over here. A flex classroom. One of the things we've done is we've taken a look at all the classroom spaces and make sure they work more than for one class. They're, they are used heavily, but there's a, there's a robust enough of them so there's growth because we can't leave you without growth. So we have to build in some growth. Construction technology. So we've looked at marine trades and carpentry and combined them. Made the space bigger, it's taller, direct access out to that loading area. So that's a space that will flex over time as construction technology flexes. So I think that's a really unique feature and evolution. Um, just some toilets, that courtyard, as I mentioned, that plays into that center. Go to the next floor. And here's the big change. You can sort of see the color patterning. This is important for me because I have to distribute the program. But what you can see is there's a mix of colors throughout. It, to me, the simple way of thinking about it, it's more integrated. Things are spread throughout. It's not like this is segregated this over here. You know, the gym's a big green thing because that's, that's the gym. The main office space needs to be near the main door. But you start to see program distribution happening where specialty spaces, whether they're CTE spaces or special ed spaces, are mixed throughout. And there's that big heart, media center, courtyard, black box theater, all there with the cafeteria. Go to the next floor. Big change on this floor is that there is a second floor around the gymnasium. So what we can do with a new gym, have a weight room overlooking a track or a walking track. Couldn't do that in the old gym, structure couldn't handle it. So we're looking at the potential of that, which again, will have views of the field as you're on that walking track and out towards this end of the site. Junior ROTC with their classroom space, which will be a shared classroom. So you could teach health in that classroom. You could teach any, you could teach math in that classroom. One of the C changes for us is a classroom is a classroom is a classroom. So it's just going to get used as it needs to get used based on schedule. Team locker rooms, direct access to a stair, either to the gym or out to the fields, soccer team, lacrosse team, things like that. Guidance office on the second floor, literally the bridge between, we'll say the well, health, guidance, and academics. Perfect spot for them overlooking that two-story space because we want to make sure we have uh, oversight over each floor. We have some of the uh, special ed spaces that will show up. There's some CTE space, that's IT computer lab with a little build lab. Classroom spaces. I want you to notice this space on the upper two floors. Those are breakout spaces. So we pull the walls out, we take the classroom out, we put a hole in the floor, now we have a two-story gathering space. So one of the things that is important as you look, we don't want you just to be able to look across. We want you to be able to look up or down, either where you're coming from or I need to go there or go up there. It's important. Same bathroom core that we've been showing. Go to the next. Again, where there wasn't color before, now there's color. So there's that weight room, the track, trainer's room, storage, team locker rooms, adult locker rooms with great supervision, laundry, so it doesn't have to go very far in a good spot. Uh, junior ROTC, some toilets up here, that guidance office, special ed. There's a system of spaces or special ed that need to work together. This cluster of three is very important to get together. Classrooms, center of the building, the teacher resource room, stacks up, same location. So again, good oversight and good proximity for teachers to be where they need to be and have the workroom space they need. Some of the CTE spaces on the ed, and that's an ELD classroom at the very end. And we just label classrooms, that could be math, that could be English, that could be social studies. It has to do all of that. Go to the next. So on a third floor, very simple design. 
we're overlooking the roof of this. There'll be a shape to the roof of the gym. There's the courtyard space right there. Again, it's more CTE spaces. Some of the STEM labs show up here now. So it becomes like a design floor. You have classroom spaces. Here's that hole in the floor right there. Here's the next one that starts to show up. That'll be a hole in the floor above. So if we show the color diagram here, again, you're seeing a distribution of colors. It's not all orange. It's not all the whatever that color is. Salmon. Salmon. So I think we're, we're getting closer to an ideal distribution of spaces uh, for everyone in the facility. And one of the nice things I should mention, too, is because of the stack of this, this whole tower can be locked down. The community can use the rest of this podium after hours without any security issues. So it's an ideal diagram from that point of view. We'll go to the next floor. So the fourth floor, again, the elevators are on the end here, centrally located. There will be views from this floor out. You probably will see water from that, this side. More STEM labs, a computer lab, and two more STEM labs, classrooms around the perimeter. You can see the hole in the floor below here that looks down. So if we go to the color version, you can see a similar distribution of color. Teachers in the center, some special ed breakout resource space, classrooms, the hole to below, the computer lab, STEM labs, ELD, on the end as well. So I should mention that this A and B, so if you think of the, the building as like a wedding cake, we've cut it and we've looked at it sideways in two different vantage points. So the next couple of images will show you, I'll talk to you about what it looks like from a three-dimensional point of view. We'll go next. So section A, you can see the four-story block. You can sort of see what's labeled breakout. That's the floor where kids can be, and then a hole to above, so I can look above. You can see on a lower one, it moves up a floor. So we have that up-down look within the building. We've shaped the roof on the top to idealize the angle for solar. So we can put a lot of solar panels on that roof, and it's at the perfect angle adjusted to true solar north. The cafeteria is that two-story space. We get some northern light, which is fantastic into there, the art rooms down here. CTE and STEM labs stack. The two floors will have vision into the cafeteria. Media center adjacent to the courtyard. Construction tech, two-story space here. So there's a lot of flexibility in that space. On the bottom, we still have the cafeteria as the main organizing element. We have the kitchen that serves it. Classroom space, some toilets, colonial kitchen, and the athletic lockers that I showed you above. So it's a very, very simple distribution of space on a site but it's really compressed to optimize open space on the site. So next. So these are some of the activities that have been going on in the background that led us to this point. So we've been finalizing the program, still going with that. So that's gonna, that's, programs have a long life because things change throughout a, a design and building process. We've been surveying the existing campus, really important defining the wetland boundaries. We found a few wetlands that surprised us, quite frankly. They're not high quality, so there are things we can do, but we're still monitoring that. We've been de developing the site in athletic field design. We showed you that potential of that additional field that we really want to be able to give you. We've been developing energy models for MEP systems to make sure that we understand life cycle costs. First cost to put the system in, but what's it gonna be for you to maintain it over time? Uh, we've been also doing that for uh, geothermal, so we've been doing a well field study, so we're studying how many wells we need. It looks like the number is 140, which would cover the building. To give you an idea, that would be the footprint of the soccer field, so we'd have wells in a grid. Been coordinating with IT and security. The, the security requirements in, in modern schools in America today it's disheartening, but it's important to do well because they still need to be welcoming buildings for the community. They need to protect, but they also need to be welcoming. So we're working through that with, uh, with, with the city and, uh, and everyone on campus. Uh, sustainable workshops, we've had two. We're gonna have another one. We've been developing a lot of metrics, a lot of information to be able to report for the next workshop. So we can have a little bit more deeper discussion. We talk daily many times a day. So the communication lines with the school 
and with everybody, senior administration has been fantastic. We have a design team that loves to work together, so we have fun, uh, but we're very serious about what we do, and we're, we're here to deliver a remarkable piece of architecture. But daily coordination, usually at 7.30 in the morning, yeah. and I'm not a morning person, so that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, and we've been advancing the architectural design. The next time I see you, I will be sharing what it looks like once we vet that. Right now, we've been in this planning process and making sure all the component pieces fit together, the puzzle works, everybody is happy with the distribution of those spaces, and it's as efficient of a building, but still artful, that we can produce, that has all the sustainable attributes that we've been challenged to provide. So I think. And I forgot to mention the importance of the community because we Very want important. to be accessible to the community. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, the importance of community. We want it to be accessible to the broader community more times throughout uh, the year. Maybe you could just talk to what you've done in other communities, because that's a, sort of new to me for yeah. other Yeah, so these buildings really, it, when you start, you think about the site, right? So it's not to be walled off that nobody can get in. You know, this is not the grounds of the breakers. This is a community asset that people should be able to use. You have an arboretum next door. So how do we bring some of that over here? So it's an extension of the park system. So it's, it's inviting, but the building itself needs to be secure. That's an unfortunate reality. But the grounds are open. They're open for people that want to use the track, that want to kick the ball around on a field, that ride their bike through here. That's really important. And you need to feel welcome. So that's a lot of communities struggle with that because we're, you know, we are in Connecticut in our home office. We, suffered through that and are still suffering with some knee-jerk reactions that are very complex to get through with a lot of communities. When it comes to the sustainable drive of your team is fantastic. It's like I said earlier, it's heartwarming because it's a very difficult thing. If you don't believe in it as a community, I can't provide it. It has to come from you. It's a ground up thing. When we look at the buildings itself, the way the program's distributed, that's different now. So the idea of, of uh, classroom buildings going a little bit more vertical and spreading out less is a new, new philosophy. It creates a more secure environment for those classrooms, but it also provides the ability to open up the rest of the building for more activities and create more open space around it. So I think those are kind of the major, major things. Yeah, so when we look at a, a, a high school, right, so we look at college to career. So it's not just about college. College is great. I loved it. Loved my five years in college. But it's about career and career and lifelong learning. That's me going back to a program to learn culinary arts, you know, to have that opportunity if I was a Newport resident. That's really important to provide that lifelong link to learning whatever that might be. And there's going to be things that come up, the painting classes, ceramics, whatever it might be, there's an opportunity there. When you think about industry in your area, EB. We did a huge building for uh, Groton when we consolidated their middle schools. It was because of the influence of EB and some of the wishes they had that the curriculum, even at the middle school level, went to a STEAM-based curriculum, really engineering focused. Yes? The things we will need to take down are the, the rotunda, the round auditorium, and likely the gym. So we'll need to uh, find some space for ALP and some of the art classes and a gym. The rest of it, we're not touching. They do. They do. They do. This not, what we've been working on as design, too, is pushing it away from the existing building even more. I've now got it off a half a gym footprint. I can't get the other half, but you know, I'm close. Yes. I was really happy to hear you say solar. To what extent is that going to um, provide the, the fuel for the school? So solar is an interesting one that we have to work with. We are designing the facility to have the capacity to be 100% of its energy provided by solar. We have enough roofscape to do that. We want to provide in a base building, enough of the solar to be a demonstration for the STEM spaces. It's going to be 
at the, I don't know if we can go back a couple, maybe the site plan. So we're working, there's lots of ways to deliver solar in a community. Uh, some community have legal restrictions with uh, like a purchase power agreement, which is a lease, or you're buying the panels. Those are all things we have to work out. But we are providing the structural capacity, the wiring or the conduit pathways to get those, to get those uh, solar panels on the roof and get a way for them to, in to integrate. So we are planning the infrastructure. We're just hoping we can uh, get the dollars to do it. Yeah, so the system will likely be a VRF system, which is so far from what you have in this facility right now with the fan going in the back room and other things. The best way to describe that, it is an extremely efficient system. So if I'm in this room and Jared is in the room next door, our air never crosses. So it's fresh air coming into the room, heating and cooling by the same cassette that's in the ceiling. There'll be like three or four in the space, three or four in the next space. It has enough fresh air. It's been one of the best systems for during the pandemic because you can segregate the rooms. They, no air crosses. It's like designing a lab building. It's, it's interesting in that regard. So it's variable frequency something. Variable yeah. Yes. So it's a pretty new system. Yeah. So one way to think about it too is if you were providing fresh air to that duct that's in the ceiling there, that diffuser, that duct would be this big. In a VRF system, that duct is this big because it's way more efficient, which gives more space to volume for kids and teaching technology where it should be, those kind of things. Yeah. We're investigating it because there is a first cost analysis that we we're working through. So that's, it's, it's not cheap. It has a, I have geothermal at my, my house and I'll tell you, it was not cheap to install. It's been great ever since, uh, but there's a payback time. Hopefully I live long enough that I can see the payback, but <laughs> it does have a first cost that is coming down. What we understand is geology here is pretty good on the field. Other locations, not so good. So concentrating on the field, we've got it down to about 140 wells. We thought we were gonna be in a 220 range. That's a significant reduction in the wells, but we'll be presenting that cost so we understand that. I don't know, that's gonna be a priority discussion with uh, the folks in the city. So what is the baseline energy source then? So the baseline energy source with a VRF system, we don't really have boilers. We have uh, compressors and chillers, little packaged units that'll be on the roof. So there's still air handlers up there. Um, you can, that would run off of electricity. Uh, which one? Uh, this one? Or? So that student parking lot, we're going to get the students over here because we can get to a more efficient parking. We know we need to get, I think the number is 14 or 16 buses that the district has. We have buses and I just shared that in my most recent discussions, the city manager is trying to find some place oh, okay. in the city. Okay. We have challenges there. Okay. I can put a plea in for we have challenges. Yeah, we have challenges. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the, uh, you show me where the, uh, the hammer, uh, yep. throw a place to Uh oh. I did it again, you know. The last presentation, there was a touch screen, and those that were there, I kept touching the screen, and it kept. And then Kathy was sent it the wrong way. And I would send it back where it was. Yeah, it was a show. Phil did. Phil has the instruction. Yeah, well. Sam Bond. Phil's very special. It is. So that's, yeah. So we have it right here. So you're throwing towards the cell tower. 
there's there is vertical nets and everything that we have to do, yeah. Yes, we have two elevators that are focused right there, so they're equidistant depending on where you are. And then how many uh, More than you can ever imagine. And so we. I don't want to imagine anything. Yeah, <laughs> no, we have. It's. This is the dean. Yeah, so code. <laughs> so cent for student restrooms are centrally located in an academic tower, so there's great oversight with the faculty right across from that. Yeah, yeah and there's a lot of things we can do to discuss how we distribute bathrooms. There's, there's actually right. more, but. Uh, there are faculty bathrooms or single-use restrooms scattered throughout. Uh, we're trying to be inclusive in our restroom design, and we're going to be working with the district around, can we do gender neutral? Can we find a way to be, uh, be better with our inclusivity as we think about every student and the value of every student? Because that is a big deal. We heard it loud and clear when we were on the phone with those students, so in and, and, and sometimes very frank language. So. I think we're, we're trying to accommodate that. But I understand your point. Restrooms are located where they can be seen. We understand there's no doors, so there's audible. Yep. So we, we, and it's no, we do this thing now like an airport where you can loop through the restroom. So you can't, somebody can't get trapped. Not that there's an issue, but we just know there can be an issue, so we design to avoid it. So the sinks are generally out in the open, so you can see kids washing their hands. Because I was young, I was a knucklehead as a youngin, and you, you know, bump elbows and you know stuff happens next to a sink. So you take that out of the equation, provide that audible sound and a visual at the sink. No, it's going to be bigger than what you have. So we have a, a large amount of athletic and PE storage, some outside field storage, some inside, uh, even down to uniform storage that we have to deal with. Okay. Yeah. Mark, you may want to say to the microphone, it's going to be a wood floor. Yes, it will be a wood floor. <laughs> On the record, wood. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I'll comment on that. So the way we've designed it, we have three alternates right now. One would be automotive, one would be cosmetology, and the other would be the central offices. And central office goes first, and Cosmo, then auto. So I'm in Winnebago. Right. <laughs> but we have a good parking lot for the Winnebago. But let me show where those are. So we have planned locations for cosmetology to be near uh, the uh, Colonial Kitchen, because that's where public would come that way, so cleaner side. And then the automotive would be on the back side here. Uh, I don't want to say dirtier side, but the side that has more service focus. So that would make sense. And the central office would be on the end right there. Yes? Is the library a multi-purpose Yes, it is. Yeah. Yep. Because I, I don't mean to say this is a library. It, it, we call it media center now, but yeah. library, yeah. Probably both. So the, the black box we're planning for 500 or 350 seats. It has capacity to go much higher than that in the cafeteria when you open that that door. The gym we're planning to accommodate a thousand kids in bleachers around the perimeter or people around the perimeter. Not for a game day because we probably don't want to use the end unless you want to be like Syracuse and have people waving at you while trying to shoot a foul <laughs> shot. But. Or Joe, do you want to? Yeah, I could, I could talk a little bit. I actually want to talk about schedule, too. Yeah. Yes. So good evening, everybody. I hope everybody remembers me. Joe DeSanti with uh, Downs Construction. So I'm glad to see everybody again. A lot of things have changed. This, you know, The schedule is evolving. The project's evolving. Um, so online, there is, if you go to RIDE's website, 
and you go there, they do have uh, a link to Northeast Chips, which is one of the places you go to. Um, yeah, yeah. And there is also, if you go to the state website, there is a sustainability link as well. And we could find that and pass that on so you could have it and we could distribute that. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that we are uh, trying to achieve net zero, the goal. Um, so that's something we're really pushing. We're talking with uh, National Grid. We're talking with a lot of other individuals as well. So that is something that we're pursuing as, in addition to. Um, the other thing I did want to talk about is schedule. Um, so we have one of the team members here that's not here, I should say, Gilbain, um, is the uh, construction manager. Uh, unfortunately, both of them are on vacation this week the, uh, and they're not able to attend. So I did want to talk a little bit about what expectations are. Um, so I could envision uh, an early start of probably late winter, early spring of 22, where we might be starting to do some work, where we might be taking the auditorium down, start preparing where some of the new building might be, um, as well as part of the gym. Um, I know one of the things that we are looking at is some alternate space for the gym and maybe utilizing one of these outdoor old shop buildings might be somewhere for a temporary gym as well. Um, but we expect the, the um, logistic plan that was presented uh, a couple of months ago to change significantly uh, because of the shift of the building. So we will, in the near future, also have a logistic plan from Gilbain that will be presenting and, and have it as part of the packet as well so everybody could see it. Um, Louisa, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the website as well, as far as anybody coming up to get information. Yes, I was going to mention the carports. <laughs> uh, the other thing that we are looking at and that we're going to uh, build into the project is we're going to put structures in place to, to be able to um, add solar carports in the future. Um, so we're going to add the, the footings, foundations, and any structures so that in the future or during the, the time the, of construction, if we identify whether we want to lease or buy that equipment, we'll be able to have that in place already. It'll be part of the project cost as well. Well, I have to say, I've been personally involved for about two years, and, <clears throat> and I'm not sure how to take that, but, but I have to say, you know, working with the co-chairs, the superintendent, and then in, in Downs, and then bringing Slam and Gilbane on, on, you guys have a premium team here, and we are all constantly advocating for, for Newport. I can tell you that right now, constantly. Um, and we will continue to. So if there's suggestions, concerns, um, you know, please voice them, uh, whether now or in the future. Speaking of solar carports, are there going to be um, charging stations for electric cars? Ooh, My hope is that a lot of the technology, the green technology that's implemented can also be part of like the construction technology and science and other programs because that's where it's going. As far as the website goes, we are very close to trying to launch it and I think we're going to do a press announcement probably in early September when people are back from vacations. So we're going to do hopefully a soft launch soon and then a well publicized launch in September. So um, these are all on the website today. Um, so you, people, you can tell people they can go online and get this video to see what's been said today on our website. And are there any other questions? On the school website. On the current mpsri.com. No, dot .net. Dot .net, yes. But there will be a whole new one. And the website name, do you? Kendra, you. Right. Newport RI School Building Projects. Right. Newport RI School Building Projects. Com. That's what it's going to be. 
Right, but we're, it's gonna be in the local papers soon. So we will let you know. Any other questions? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's not known. But I did want to just say also, um, just as he, Joe DeSanti just said, I mean, he works a lot with RIDE up in Providence and because he's doing a lot of work on the Pro Providence public schools. So we're very lucky to have them as well. And Dr. Jermaine, I'm going to say too, because she has network. We are trying to get funding for other parts of these buildings so we can add on all those additional um, three add-on parts, and we are working very hard. As I said, she didn't. Both of these guys didn't really get to take their vacation this year because we've just been working on Zoom in Maine when I'm on vacation too. So, but anyhow. <laughs> but we appreciate you all coming. We really do. Um, when the website does come online, you can go right in, ask questions at any time, and we will respond as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to? Yep. Just for people, is a Zoom, is this better than a Zoom for you? Yes. Because we're allowed to have this also on Zoom. I tried working better because of the problem. There were at least five people who wanted to be here and were out of town. I could have made an hour and been here. Right. So yeah. I would have been here. So maybe we take some more and yeah. we do something for you on Zoom. Right. I am going to say that at the next uh, school committee meeting, Tuesday, uh, which I'm not coming to, but um, there's going to be a vote on trying to get hybrid technology. We don't have it today, so as soon as we can get that in, and Robert Young, I mean, Jared, do you know the status of that? Or no? Robert Young is technology director, so he has done the research and hopefully soon enough we can do hybrid both. It's just mostly elected officials and people who are employed are not allowed to go. But we should, anybody from the community should be able to do that and participate, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, so to be housed at Pell. Okay, great. But we really thank you all for coming. Spread the word. Tell people to go to the website and hear what's been presented today. And thank you very much.